So a few of you have been asking about Niels Vigo Hansen's chapter in Physics and Whitehead um, on space, time, and becoming, uh, overcoming the contradiction between special relativity and the passage of time. And so I wanted to just briefly try to summarize the main points that Hansen is uh, is making and the, the contribution that I feel um, his interpretation of this conflict, um, the, the contributions he's making to a, a deeper understanding of the nature of time um, by resolving the conflict between human experience and uh, special relativity. So he first lays out what the problem is in the contradiction between the what he calls the temporalist and the atemporalist interpretations. Um, Einstein would be an atemporalist in the sense that um, his interpretation of relativity is such that the, uh, the tensed uh, nature of our experience, that is to say the, um, the asymmetry of time where the past, the present, and the future uh, are um, modally distinct, or we could say ontologically distinct, uh, the past is already actualized, it has uh, occurred, we inherit it in the present, and we anticipate a future which has not yet occurred, right? This is the sort of phenomenological um, account of our common sense experience of time, and special relativity calls this into question. The model proposed by Einstein uh, points out that when it comes to trying to measure things like simultaneity, Right, the simultaneity of an event which occurs uh, here with an event which occurs over there, um, that the attempts to measure this run into certain limitations, namely the finite speed of light. And so um, while from my vantage point, I may observe uh, something happening now, from someone else's vantage point, um, particularly if they are themselves in motion relative to where I am, um, what I call now won't be now for them. And indeed, the order of events itself that, from my vantage point, I observe as taking place, you know, first A, then B, from some other vantage point, uh, B might occur before A, right? And um, the special theory of relativity posits the invariant speed of light, and the invariant uh, laws of nature and using what's called uh, the Lorentz transformations, um, even though from different vantage points, the order of events can appear <laughs> reversed, um, there's still a way to relate these two uh, inertial reference frames is what, how we would describe these vantage points in the context of special relativity. There's a way to relate these so that they belong to one four dimensional um, space-time metric, right? The problem here, at least um, for the problem for um, fitting this into our common sense understanding of how time works is that these Lorentz transformations imply things like time dilation and um, length contraction. So these are very odd phenomena that um, have in fact been empirically observed. And so we know that there, you know, the facts suggest that um, there are multiple time systems in nature and that these, these strange effects do indeed take place. Now, um, Hansen goes through some of the critical responses to Einstein's understanding of, of time and space-time, including Bergson's and um, Heidegger's Bergson and Heidegger are both temporalist in the sense that they want to defend our human experience, our common sense phenomenology. Um, however, Heidegger really distances himself from, from natural science altogether, viewing the um, scientific approach to measuring and calculating as a form of inauthentic existence that pulls us away from um, the real existential uh, temporality that constitutes our human being. And so um, Heidegger is just pretty much uh, uninterested in what science is doing and 
you know, Hansen points out that he ends up running into some some contradictions uh, in that centering our human experience of temporality uh, is one thing, but then Heidegger also wants to make reference to nature, for example, the daily, um, the rotation of the earth that leads to a day and a night cycle. This helps um, human beings um, feel like they're participating in these larger cycles and it gives us a sense of orientation um, in, in the flow of temporality. And so, you know, here's Heidegger making reference to nature as though we have some kind of unmediated access to these rhythms at the same time that he is saying that natural science is inauthentic and um, too abstract and pulls us out of uh, an authentic relationship to the human condition. Bergson, on the other hand, was way more interested in being in dialogue with physicists and scientists and indeed thought that uh, the proper understanding of Einstein's own theory supported uh, a sense of this um, concrete duration as the basis of time. Now, Einstein disagreed with that. Bergson and Einstein had this, this exchange in 1922 where Einstein says that, you know, there's no such thing as this special duration. Um, Einstein called it the philosopher's time. There's only the time uh, that physics measures with clocks, objective time, if you will. And then there's our subjective perception, which is ultimately an illusion because of course, uh, you know, science is giving us the objective truth and the history of science from Einstein's point of view is constantly challenging our common sense intuitions and forcing us to, re uh, to reject them in favor of the abstract descriptions of science. Now, Bergson runs into trouble, as Hansen points out, because he, he wanted to maintain in his temporalist understanding of concrete time or duration some sense of a cosmic now, right? Because we do, in a sense, have an intuition that now, for me, can be meaningfully applied across the entire expanse of the universe, right? Now is as much now for me here as it is for someone on Mars, right? But as, um, you know, Einstein's special theory points out, we have no way of determining that because we cannot send information to coordinate clocks across that distance between Earth and Mars um, instantaneously, right? And so um, we have to let go of this, this notion of... Um, a cosmic now. And Bergson didn't want to do that. And Bergson also thought that the um, Lorenz transformations and the, uh, the sort of prediction that uh, indeed there would be time dilation. So, you know, there's the famous twin paradox where you have two twins on the earth. One goes in a rocket ship, um, blasts away from earth close to the speed of light, and then turns around and comes back. Um, because of time dilation, the twin in the rocket would have, relative to the twin on Earth, experienced less time, and so would have aged less than the twin who remained on Earth, who, let's say, you know, the twin on the rocket went away for a year and came back, he would have aged a year. The twin on the Earth aged 10 years. Right? And for Bergson, this was nonsense. Couldn't happen. It was a confusion um, of an abstract model with our concrete intuition of time, which, which always endures and, and passes at the same rate for us as, as observers, which may be phenomenologically the case. It's not as though the twin on the rocket uh, experienced time passing more slowly. He experienced time just as we normally do. It's just that relative to the stationary twin, who remained on the Earth, um, when you compare their two time systems again after the twin on the rocket went on his journey and returned, they've fallen out of sync, right, because of this time dilation. And this has been observed, not in this exact experiment, um, we don't have rockets that can travel close to the speed of light, but we, we can measure the minuscule effect of time dilation by taking two synchronized clocks and putting one in an airplane and flying it around for a while and bringing it back looking at the difference, it's been observed, right? So Bergson 
uh, seems to have made some scientific mistakes here. Now, what Whitehead does is defend a form of um, temporalism, right? In other words, defend our concrete experiential sense of um, inheriting a past and anticipating a future, which is open-ended, right? Um, Whitehead is able to preserve this sense of concrete time and the passage of nature and of becoming and creative advance and all of this, while at the same time acknowledging the effects uh, that we observe um, that ground the special theory of relativity. And he does this by saying, look, okay, there's no cosmic now. There are multiple time systems in nature and a sort of genetic relationship between occasions of experience that allow for local simultaneity and a sense of a kind of rhythmic unison of becoming whereby, um, you know, in our local environments, in each moment of our experience, we have this distinct practical sense of sharing a present, right? Even if metaphysically speaking, that's not actually the case because there's a, a finite rate of causal transmission between occasions. Um, Einstein describes this in terms of the invariant speed of light. Whitehead just generalizes this and talks about um, the speed of causes, causal transmission, if you want. It's not something special about light. Uh, it's just the, the metaphysical structure underlying causal relationship is such that, um, you know, as, as a causal influence propagates along these historical roots, right, of occasions of experience, um, there's a, a certain amount of time that it takes for that propagation to occur such that I can't know what's happening on Mars right now. Um, I can know what's happening right now in a more local sense, at least um, for the purposes of practical life. And so Whitehead's compromise here is to say that local simultaneity is a practical reality because of this unison of becoming of occasions of experience that are in the same general region, even though global simultaneity is, uh, is impossible, right? And so there's no cosmic clock. There's no universal now. There are many more or less overlapping time systems, some time systems that don't overlap at all because their light, their light cones are not um, overlapping, right? So one of the interesting points that Hansen makes, and it's, you know, he, he sort of mentions it without going into too much detail, is the, the theological underpinnings of the classical um, conception of time and the, the new process theological orientation that's required in order to understand what Whitehead is saying, because you know, Whitehead is rejecting the idea of a God's eye view as though God were outside space-time looking in, right? And implicit in Einstein's view is this sort of um, Spinozistic God uh, that's identical with the universe, but nonetheless can... Einstein was imagining um, that God could take the perspective of eternity and see the whole of time, past, present, and future, as though arrayed in some sort of a block, a four-dimensional block universe, right? And so, from, and so from Einstein's point of view, the whole point of physics is to arrive at this God's eye perspective, whereby, um, you know, the difference between the past, present, and future is nothing but a stubbornly persistent illusion, uh, enforced by our perceptual limitations as organisms, but physicists are trying to get out of that perspective to take the global view. And so while Einstein denied global or cosmic simultaneity, he was affirming a kind of um, global picture of the entirety of space-time, including the future, which would just be deterministic in this view. And what Whitehead is doing is by imagining um, this new conception of the divine as uh, as caught up in the process of creativity as we are as creatures, um, Whitehead doesn't have this temptation to imagine an outside view or a global view of the whole universe because of the atemporality, sorry, the asymmetry of time, um, the future is, is as yet undetermined and even God doesn't know what's going to happen yet. And also, um, 
God can't step outside the universe to observe it from the outside, nor can, can God um, view the universe as though it were just this space-time block. God experiences the universe from the multiplicity of perspectives, of occasions of experience that are flashing into existence in, in each moment. Um, and I see I'm already sort of um, falling into the common sense understanding of a cosmic now, right? When I say each moment, I don't necessarily, I don't mean um, each moment in the cosmic clock because there is no cosmic clock, right? Um, now for me is different from now for you, which is obvious because I'm recording this, but um, even if you were sitting right next to me, there's some minuscule uh, difference in the, um, the time systems or the inertial frames that we both inhabit, right? Because um, of the finite speed of light or the uh, finite rate of causal transmission between occasions of experience. So hopefully that helps you understand what Hansen is up to in this chapter. Um, I'm happy to you know, continue to dialogue with you and I wish I could join you for the uh, Zoom session tomorrow, Friday, but uh, I cannot apologize about that. Um, but we can definitely continue to, to work through this together in the discussion forum for module seven. All right.